you've got a small population. Here in Bhutan, you have big ambitions. You don't, have, you don't uh, hesitate to think for yourselves and be different, and that's something I very much admire. You know, what's good enough for the rest of the world isn't necessarily good enough for Bhutan. And one of the indications of this is your wonderful gross national happiness measure, which I admire very much. Now, I've found since I've been here, and I already knew through reading the um, report of your seminar a year ago and in various other ways, that BBS is already committed to public service broadcasting, and I'm delighted to hear all the commitments from um, government figures here as well. I've been sitting in the newsroom for the last few days, and i found that it does cover news in a very objective way, and uh, so that is probably the key and most important aspect of public service broadcasting. But there are other aspects too which I think BBS meets, and that is to reach virtually all the people here, to respect the cultural values of Bhutan, and to appeal to all sections of society, and also to have public funding. Now, um, there's a lot of innovation going on within BBS. You, they have a drive to get the same staff covering stories on both news and television, which is an excellent move. It's actually cheaper and it's more efficient. And um, while it's quite a struggle to do to begin with, with the kind of young teams that there are in BBS, I think they'll achieve it very well. And I'm also very pleased to find that there's a strong and growing um, independent sector, particularly in radio, with five radio stations, one college station, and moving towards opening up a commercial TV broadcaster. Now, there are a lot of people here, and most many of them in this room, who are thinking hard about how broadcasting in Bhutan should develop. So we've got a good situation now, but things do change. Sometimes things go downwards, they don't go upwards, and what can be done to preserve and develop broadcasting in Bhutan so that in the years ahead it develops to suit this society in the best possible way. Because there are a lot of options, and some of the options lead to the kind of consumer-based societies that Bhutan, I think, doesn't want to be. And others lead to societies where Initiatives for broadcasters are constrained by too much state control, sometimes politely disguised as self-censorship. And then another road leads to a high-quality media, which is free, responsible, in tune with local culture and values, and makes a positive contribution to democratic development, and also to prosperity, and also it could to greater national happiness. Now, in my time in the BBC World Service, and also with the Commonwealth Broadcasting Association, I visited many countries and I looked in detail at their broadcasting. And I found that some of them have clearly taken the wrong route. And they now find themselves with a media that they feel actually subverts the values that they want to promote. In, and I have particularly in mind many countries of the Caribbean, for example. Now, they've got a lot of islands and the three biggest islands in the um, Anglophone Car Caribbean, the Commonwealth Caribbean, they have populations of around a million. So they're roughly comparable to Bhutan. And the problem there, there for them is that they've licensed so many radio stations, so many TV stations, that there isn't enough um, advertising money to sustain this volume of broadcasting. And also because the competition is so ferocious, the state radios and the public service ones are um, not doing so well as they used to. So as the um, TV and radio stations, the commercial ones, they, some of them go bust because they can't uh, manage, and then lo and behold, another one gets licensed to replace it. And that's really not a good idea. It's too, it's too um, competitive and it's too tough to survive. And the chronic underfunding leads to very low quality programming. With endless um, phone in programs and endless sponsorship deals, which are really rather unsatisfactory. They, for example, they sponsor support 
a program about, shall we say, motoring. And since they're paying for it, they influence the content. So that, lo and behold, if the sponsor has a chain of garages or something like that, they get featured in the program. Now, that really shouldn't happen. It's not fair. It means you're buying um, time, and the people who are watching it don't realize that there's a financial interest behind the program. And um, it uh, really should be a separate ad department, separate from the programming that doesn't influence it. But the money is there with business, and the stations are desperate, so a lot of it is going on. And things like local history, children's programming, civic issues, they don't come with money attached, and so it's much harder to get them covered. Now, I've also been in the opposite kind of countries where there's a lot of sensitivity on the part of government when, when anything critical is covered. And at one point, I actually organized some assistance to Kenya. And it was during the time of President Moy, when he was in power, and I sent a consultant to work on them to try and achieve fair election coverage, because it was very pro-government party, uh, exclusively pro-government party at that time. And after a number of visits, the consultant got all the political parties to agree on a formula for the time allocated to each party, based on the current number of MPs. It was an objective measure. And this was formally signed up to by everyone concerned, the parties, the Electoral Commission, and the broadcaster. Well, when the election came, the agreement was adhered to for the first week. And opposition figures appeared on air in proportion to the formula. And then I understand, President Roy asked, who are these opposition politicians who keep appearing? And why are they on radio and TV? So the agreement was explained to him. But with a flip of his fly whisk, you remember his fly whisk? It was gone. They're off the air. Well, he won that election, but he lost the following one. So, you know, you can do things and you fail, but sometimes it may have a long-term effect, even though the short-term effect is not what you hoped. Now, in many parts of Africa, and other parts of the world too, the state broadcaster feels an obligation to ensure the return of the government at elections, and also to cover government activities favorably all year round. And they call it nation building, a very respectable word, nation building but not such a respectable practice. And it has the sad effect that it's very difficult for any inefficiency, wrong decisions or corruption to be examined or exposed. And now I do believe that the possibility of exposing such failures is actually more important than the, the actual individual uh, failures that you do expose. If people react, they get frightened that they might be exposed and that affects their behavior. <coughs> So um, I think that's very important, and um, it's a key aspect of a, a free and media in a democratic society. Now, I know that Bhutan is um, very seriously committed to good government, 